Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Sniper on the Eastern Front, Chapter 11. Mistakes are made just once. In the last quarter of 1943, the Wehrmacht started to install sniper schools in its largest training camps. Here, in courses lasting just four weeks, they tried to prepare chosen soldiers for the special role of marksmen. The soldiers chosen for these courses were a mixture of freshly called up recruits and old hands with extensive frontline experience who'd been selected by their officers as potential marksmen. All of them would get, besides the marksman's gun, the necessary special training they required. The marksman training for the Gebirgsjäger took place in Austria, in the military training area called Seetaler Alpe, near the city of Judenburg. From here, it was not far to Zepp's home village. So, Captain Kloss slyly demoted him to the rank of an occasional marksman who needed to attend a special course at Seetaler Alpe. Since this almost took him home, he could afterwards take his then-day home leave from there. And so, on May the 30th, 1944, Zepp and ten other men were given leave and left their comrades in the back of an Opel Blitz and set off along the division supply line. Before leaving, he handed his Russian marksman's rifle to his regimental armorer, who gave it to another rifleman while Zepp was present. Do you see the notches in the stock? The NCO asked the recipient. Every notch is one Russian less. To take over this gun is an honor and an obligation. Do your best and show Zepp when he returns that you've represented him worthily. The young Lancer looked quite amazed and embarrassed by these heroic words, but Zepp put his hand on his shoulder and said, Don't let them make you crazy, just be careful and don't get your ass hurt. He reached into his pocket and brought out a handful of Russian explosive bullets wrapped in his handkerchief, which he kept for use in special circumstances and handed them to his comrade. I don't need them now. If you need a real bang in the gun and want to be sure of something spectacular in your sights, use one of these. It's explosive ammunition, but be economical with it, it's very rare. Other than that, just stay safe. You have to tell me what happened when I get back in six weeks. The truck's motor howled, Zepp jumped into the bag and shook his comrade's hand again. With it, an indescribable premonition of death hit him, and suddenly he thought, poor dog, he'll be caught quickly. Are you girls through with your heartbreaking goodbye? I'll start crying soon too, yelled the lorry driver. Then he stepped on the accelerator and in a cloud of dust and exhaust, Zepp's comrades were left behind. Zepp wondered if he would ever see them again. A strange mixture of relief at being able to escape the hell of war for a while and guilt at leaving his comrades behind took hold of him. After just a year in the army, his former life had been wiped away and the daily fight for survival had become his only reality. And he seemed to be addicted to the brutal fascination of killing or being killed. But before long, such profound thoughts were washed away by the sonorous humming of the lorry's motor. Cozy sleepiness came over him. It was two days before he realized that he had got away from the war. The tranquil, undisturbed landscape through which he traveled by train seemed almost unreal. Whereas his journey to the front had taken more than ten days a year ago, it now took only five to get to his destination, Judenburg. Zepp was lucky, because a lance corporal who had delivered a parcel to the station for his company chief took him back to the training area in his jeep. Zepp looked forward to the training with mixed emotions, because he vividly remembered his basic training in which the instructors were always yelling and the soldiers were trained in stupid drill. He had only agreed to being delegated to attend the course because he didn't want to miss the opportunity of a few weeks of good meals, regular sleep and the chance of a few days at home. He was amazed when he was welcomed in almost amiable fashion when he reported in at the sergeant's office at the training school. No standing to attention, just a friendly and pleasant introduction to his quarters and the approaching course. It became obvious that here it was all about the qualified training of specialists, not the drill-like hammering in of basic knowledge. Within the extensive training area, the marksman school was in a separate hut complex. Zepp shared his room with four 18-year-olds from the Mittenwalderland, who had been sent straight to the school after their three months basic training. They had proven themselves to be extraordinarily good shots with stoic attitudes and very good power of observation. When he entered the room, his eyes fell on a framed text on the wall. There was written in gothic letters. The marksman is the hunter among soldiers. His duty is heavy and demands the whole man, physically and mentally. Only a completely convinced and steadfast soldier can become a marksman. It is only possible to defeat the enemy if you have learned to hate and pursue him with the whole strength of your soul. 
Being a marksman is a decoration for the soldier. He fights unseen. His strength lies in red Indian-like use of terrain combined with perfect camouflage, cat-like agility and masterly control of his weapon. Awareness of his skills gives him safety and superiority and guarantees him victory. These heroic words did not leave him unmoved. A certain pride welled up within him. But at the same time, this was tempered by his awareness of the reality of war and its mercilessness. And something inside him froze at that, and he thought, if you knew what war is really like, if you were dying, sayings like these would be of no use to you at all. His training course started the same day, a Monday, with a lesson in special weapons dedicated to the topic of guns with telescopic sights. The instructor was a sergeant with an artificial leg. It came out that almost all the trainers were experienced frontline soldiers disabled by wounds. Many were even former marksmen who, like Zepp, had worked hard to learn their skills until they were no longer fit for duty at the front. The course consisted of 60 soldiers organized in groups of five. Each group had its own teacher for every topic. On a table were four guns with telescopic sights. There were three K98K models and a weapon none of them had seen before. At the front, Zepp had heard rumors about a new self-loading rifle, but he hadn't seen one in his unit. It was a Walter Model 43 with a Forklander Model 4 telescopic sight. Beside it was a K98K with a really tiny telescopic sight of about 15 cm length named the Model 41. Another of the K98s lying before them had a six times magnification Dialitan telescopic sight produced by the Hensoldt company on a massive swivel mounting called a Mauser mounting by the trainer but in modern terminology called a tower swivel mounting. This was considered the best and most solid telescopic sight mounting for the K98K. After a few remarks concerning the efficiency of the individual telescopic sights and mountings, he elaborated on the carbine with the swivel mounting because it was the weapon all the course's participants would be equipped with. In the afternoon they went on the shooting range to try all four of these weapons. Zepp took great interest in the range and the brightness and brilliance of the Zeiss and Hensoldt sight, which was clearly better than his former Russian weapon. But very similar to this was the sight of the self-loading rifle. Shooting with the Walter was very easy because part of the recoil was absorbed by the automatic reloading mechanism, but its precision lagged behind the K98 carbines. The weapon with the little ZF-41 sight amused everyone. It shot quite well, but you could hardly see anything through the tiny sight. The trainer's comment was, such shit can only be created by those idiots in administration. Those armchair fathers know as much about marksmen as a cow knows about singing songs. After this, they had to perform various exercises shooting with the normal K98K over open sights, standing, kneeling, lying and at different distances from 50 meters to 300 meters. They had no lack of ammunition and were able to go through their exercises without having to endure the usual drill that applied in firing ranges. Training and learning were clearly the priority. The next day they went out into the grounds of the training area to estimate distances and to assess the tactical prospects of different types of hiding places. The afternoon was spent on the range again and this proved to be the case every day during the course. Later in the week the subjects of camouflage and special positions were added to the curriculum. Zepp didn't learn much new from these. Some of the camouflages and positions seemed pretty time-consuming and unrealistic to him because the daily routine of war didn't leave sufficient time or means to achieve them. For example, there were hollowed-out trees, a full-body camouflage made out of tree bark and an earth seat under a milestone rebuilt from plywood. But in his own experience, camouflage had to be quick, effective and easy to create from the simplest materials available and should limit the marksman's mobility as little as possible. The course leader knew Zepp had served as a marksman but was unaware of his experience and skills. As the course went on, however, he recognized his expertise. The timetable for the last day of their first week showed a class was to be held in the shooting garden. Zepp and his comrades had no idea what this meant and were curious about it. Great was their amazement when they found themselves led to a miniature landscape. About 50 meters in front of their firing butts was a model of an idyllic valley containing a village and roads, all built to a reduced scale. It made them feel like Gulliver in Lilliput. They were issued with special weapons for this training, because they had to shoot with small caliber sporting guns. The weapons were made by Gustloff and Walter and were equipped with telescopic sights. 
The Gustloff Rifle had a Model 41 sight on the left side, while the Walter Gun had a 4 times magnification telescope by the Eugi Company of Berlin. Their task was to observe the model landscape and shoot at little figures as soon as they appeared somewhere, in windows, behind houses or among the trees. There were even vehicles and horse carriages that moved along the roads and they had to shoot at them too. Zapp's tactical experience showed especially well in this training. His experienced eye picked out the slightest movement and it was seldom more than 30 seconds before his shot hit its target, but only with the four times telescopic sight on the Walter. The Model 41 sight had such a small diameter and limited range of vision that almost all the students considered it entirely unsuitable for use by marksmen. The talents of a perfectionist like Zeb shown in this practice and were so rare among the usual participants of such courses that their instructor foresaw he could do little to improve his skills. Regular practice in the shooting garden was part of the training program throughout the course. Not only did they have to shoot into the model village, but also into constantly revised and rebuilt landscapes in which unknown targets were hidden that they had to find and fight. An ongoing competition between the candidates started with their first day in the shooting garden because the results of the daily practices were recorded on separate pages of the course logbook. The best student on the course would be discovered this way and would be rewarded with a big parcel of luxuries including spirits, cigarettes, chocolate and canned meat. All participants of the course had to keep a little notebook and carry it with them. In this they wrote down such things as observations regarding the terrain and their shooting scores. This was to accustom the future marksmen to keeping a similar notebook when they returned to the front, in which they should enter details about the terrain, changes of firing position and hits scored. Zeb tipped off his comrades to always encode all entries that might betray their function as marksmen and never to enter their name. It would be even better if they entered no hits into the book at all, he said, but kept them in a separate nameless list held by their sergeant. Such discretion would probably save their lives if they were captured, since their role would remain unknown. Captured marksmen on the Eastern Front were always tortured and killed. The young men paled at Zeb's warning. Monday on the second week was a big day for the course participants, because a lorry arrived with big boxes stenciled with the Mauser Company code BYF. Everybody helped to unload them and they were able to satisfy their curiosity by opening one. Inside was a brand new K98 carbine with a big 4x magnification sight in a tower swivel mounting. During the next few hours every student received one of these. The number was entered into his book with the remark, telescopic sight rifle. This meant that each particular weapon was only to be used by its recipient. They were told that they would not really own their weapon until they had successfully completed the course. This increased their determination to pass the course, especially among the younger soldiers without any fighting experience. Zepp got a carbine with a sight by the Hensoldt company, which had the codename BMJ. It was much shorter than the Russian rifle he had left behind and the sight was much better as he had already found during the demonstration of the various guns the previous week. Proud of their new weapons, they could hardly wait to get on the firing range to try them out. After his very first shot, Zepp knew that he had a super weapon in his hands. Now, for the first time, they also received special ammunition for marksmen. The instructor explained that these were cartridges with an especially precise load, such as were usually used during gun making and repairing in order to determine the accuracy of the weapon. He recommended that they should beg their battalion armorer to issue them with such ammunition as often as possible after their return to the front line. After this, they enthusiastically set about calibrating their weapons. The basic calibration was made over a distance of 100 meters. To do this, they removed the breech and then, resting the weapon on sandbags, aimed the barrel of the gun at the center of their target by looking directly through it. By alternating between looking through the barrel and the sight, the sight's radical was brought into alignment with the barrel. The sideways deviation was then corrected by the alternate loosening and tightening of two screws on the back foot of the mounting by means of a special key that was included with every weapon. After this basic adjustment, the fine-tuning was made during the practice shoot. The day ended with them being instructed never to let their weapon out of their hands. During the rest of the course they carried it with them the whole day. In every bedroom there was a gun rack in which the weapons were only put overnight. In this way they learned how to take care of their carbines and keep them from damage, especially the optics. Every fall or hard knock to the side could ruin the adjustment and seriously affect its accuracy. 
Zepp, of course, had become wise to this by bitter experience during his early days with his Russian telescopic rifle and handling his weapon carefully had now become second nature. But the other participants of the course had trouble with handling their carbines for the first few days, but they learned, since apart from the fact that the sights had to be readjusted after every fall or knock, there were gymnastic interludes for the clumsy directly after each such incident, 20 push-ups and 30 knee bends with the carbine held out before them. Their visit to the shooting garden the next day was described as choice and improvement of positions. But before they went to practice, they were shown a marksman training film in the classroom. To their amazement, the film was Russian with German subtitles. It was shot in 1935 and gave an impressive insight into the high standard of Russian training. Before screening it, their trainer commented, Just take a close look at this. Ivan isn't bad. His marksmen were making trouble for us already during the advance of 41 to 42 and we were standing there in short shirts. Then we didn't even know how to spell marksmen. Losses among our officers were disastrous. If there were no heavy weapons, the Russian marksmen stopped us for days. With telescopic rifles captured from Ivan, we tried to do something about that. But the swine were really good and we had to learn the hard way. Finally, I too found my match. You can see where he hit me. I was damn lucky to escape death once again. With that, he lowered his head so that they could all see the massive scar from which a glass eye stared fixedly from where his left eye had been. It was a twist of fate and great publicity for the Zeiss company that the Ivan's bullet bounced off my binoculars and I just lost an eye and not my life, he went on. As already said, almost all the trainers at the school were former marksmen who were no longer fit for fighting because of serious injuries but could do a valuable job by transmitting their experience and knowledge to the recruits. So be aware that the enemy has professionals too. And I can give you one hot tip. Piss off as soon as you recognize a hostile marksman is after you. When there is, there's just one thing you can do. Change position after every shot. With a monotonous rattle, the movie went through the projector. His comrades watched the show with dutiful attention, but Zepp did not see anything new and had to fight against sleep after a few minutes in a darkened room. Like a rabbit, he dozed with open eyes in a half-comatose state that only experienced soldiers can control in classrooms before a scene in the film suddenly caught his attention. It showed a Russian marksman company preparing positions in the treetops at the edge of a forest. The subtitle read, Leafy treetops are in excellent position. The shooter is not seen, but he has a wide view of the landscape and an outstanding field of fire. Shit, Zepp thought, and immediately he put his hand up. The lessons were very interactive and immediately accommodated questions, suggestions and answers. His request to speak was noticed at once and the film was stopped. Zepp said that he could tell them more about the scene that had just been shown from his own experience and he told them about his fight with the female marksman in the trees. The awkward silence that followed was broken by the trainer with the remark Listen to this, boys. This rifleman knows what he's talking about because he survived more than a year as a marksman at the front and you should hammer it into your brain that mistakes are made just once by a marksman and in 90% of cases you're done for at that. So, take in all the useful hints you can get. Every good piece of advice you can get and keep might save your ass one day. The days passed and Zepp enjoyed eating well and sleeping regularly. On the one hand, he was happy to escape the daily fear for his life for a while, but on the other hand, he often thought of his comrades and how they might be getting along. He tried to find out what the 3rd Gebirgsjäger Division was doing, but the heavily censored newspapers didn't say anything worthwhile. On a few occasions, the trainers were able to pass on information that soldiers on leave had given them. According to this, it was relatively quiet in the 3rd Gebirgsjäger Division sector. Theory and practical instruction complemented each other. Over the next days, they were put into hypothetical combat situations in which they had to act independently and the demands placed on them were constantly increased, climaxing in a very realistic scenario. The day before this, everybody had to prepare a marksman's position under given circumstances and they had to move into this the next morning. Shortly before moving into their positions, they were given a description of the prevailing combat situation, which was that two enemy marksmen were out to get them. Two instructors would observe and record every opportunity they gave the enemy snipers to hit them. Any visible movement by the students would mean they were dead. Then they were told that they wouldn't be allowed to leave their positions until dawn the next day. A look of horror spread across the other students' faces. Zepp knew why. Being tied to one spot for so long presents a number of logistical problems. Eating, 
drinking, pissing and shitting, when, how and where were they to be done? Zepp, as a veteran, had chosen and prepared his position accordingly, so that these things could be achieved as far as possible. His inexperienced comrades faced a more challenging ordeal. After that, they tagged a light camouflage of grass and fresh branches onto their helmets and moved into their positions. An oppressively hot day was coming up. In the shimmering sunlight, a training area stretched away before them. By about noon, the sweat was flowing from them like water, their limbs were starting to hurt, and various physical needs were demanding their attention. For the first few hours, Zeb just observed the approaches and recorded significant things. During this time, he managed to make out the instructor's positions. With that, all the important tasks of the day were done as far as he was concerned. As usual, he had prepared his position in a way that would enable him to disappear unseen. This not only provided better security against enemy grenades, but also allowed him to endure the long wait in relative comfort. He had already dug an additional hole into which he could pee by turning slightly to one side, and he always did his big jobs before he started his day. Finally, as an experienced marksman, he always made sure that he had water and food with him, even if it was only a crust or some biscuits. So he just slid back into the protecting depth of his position and spent his day dozing, dreaming and chewing. After daybreak next day, the order came to withdraw and they gathered for the march back to camp. Many of his inexperienced comrades were dragging themselves along utterly exhausted. They all had a big piss spot on their pants and many were walking with legs apart and faces distorted by disgust, having shit in their pants. One of the instructors couldn't resist a complacent grin when he saw this. Boys, I have a hot tip for you. Always shit in the morning. Anyone who leaves home without shitting only has himself to blame. The assholes did that on purpose, hissed Zap's neighbor. The next day, the positions of every single candidate were visited and judged according to their suitability. Zap was asked to explain the pros and cons of his own, and he willingly gave his comrades the benefit of his experience at the front, explaining that the essence of selecting a good position involved the big three house how to get into the position unseen, how to get out of the position unseen, and how to reach the next position quickly and unseen. The rest of the course seemed to fly by, and many of the participants started to feel uneasy at the prospect of their approaching deployment to the front. They got a foretaste during a training day about ammunition. Marksmen often moved about ahead of their own lines. If spotted by the enemy, they were usually subjected to the fire of heavy infantry weapons. It was therefore an advantage to recognize these weapons by their sound in order to take the right defensive actions. If he was shot at by a mortar, for example, it was just a question of time until the enemy either got his range or peppered the area until they finally hit the marksman. Under these circumstances, it was necessary for him to leave his position as fast as possible and unable to make a covered withdrawal, all he could do was bravely jump up and zigzag back to his own lines at the run. As already explained among marksmen, this was called the rabbit jump. It called for a high degree of willpower, but it was the only way to survive in such a situation. The rabbit jump was consequently practiced repeatedly during the course, though many marksmen would later die because when the moment of truth came, they stayed in their holes paralyzed by panic and fear. While the mortar could be demonstrated to them by live shots, the sound of one of the most feared Russian weapons of all was only available as a gramophone record. Known as the Stalin organ by frontline soldiers, this was a lorry-borne multiple rocket launcher that could turn an area the size of a soccer field into an inferno of buzzing splinters and churned up earth in just one strike. The recording of its rhythmic howling sound turned up to full volume made them shudder. It brought back vivid memories to Zepp, who could almost taste the sulfur, smoke and blood on his tongue. Asked by his comrades how they could protect themselves against such a weapon, he had just a short answer while a shadow came over his face that made him look ten years older. Only a deep hole will help you. Then press your ass cheeks together and pray. The session concluded with the introduction of ammunition that was new to infantry use, the so-called B cartridge. This had originally been developed as a tracer round for the machine guns of fighter planes, the B standing for Beobachtung, which means observation. These cartridges exploded when they struck and thus indicated the accuracy of the fire. The fire of the aircraft could then be swiftly adjusted. This ammunition was very expensive to produce and was consequently reserved for its original purpose for a long time. But the Russians, who had this kind of ammunition even before the beginning of the campaign, had already started using it against infantry. 
The brutal effect of such projectiles was understandably feared among the Lancers, in particular because the Russian marksmen liked to use it. Zepp, of course, already knew about such cartridges, having used captured Russian rounds. He therefore considered it appropriate that such ammunition should be available to the Germans as well. According to the Geneva Convention, explosive ammunition for hand weapons was actually illegal, but the situation on the Eastern Front had now slipped so far that the end justified any and all means available. In a short shooting demonstration, saplings about 5 cm in diameter were cut down effortlessly with this ammunition. From the fourth week of the course, the training became even more realistic. Besides daily basic practices on the firing range and in garden, the future marksmen underwent practical lessons on how to change positions. For these, combat situations were imitated as realistically as possible. These lessons included moving undiscovered between other units practicing military exercises in the training area and hunting for each other as marksmen would have to in the field. Finally, their shooting practice in the garden was integrated into these lessons and they had not only to find the hidden targets but also to fire at them with live ammunition. This involved locating and shooting at dummies within a set time. If they didn't succeed, they received negative marks from the instructors and the dire warning that they would be dead under real frontline conditions. In this way, Zeb's inexperienced comrades got a better idea of the danger that they would face in the field. When these practical lessons began, the trainee marksmen died like flies. Even Zepp made mistakes, though this was because the training adhered to official Wehrmacht policy that a marksman's battlefield role was strictly offensive, whereas Zepp would have resolved many situations with greater caution. A good marksman had to know when to disappear, but the course made no allowance for individuals taking such decisions. The course had flown by and it ended with a celebration on the last Saturday evening. Their sergeant managed to get a hold of a barrel of beer, a few bottles of schnapps and some sides of pork, so they made the most of the very welcome summer weather by organizing a barbecue. Tables and chairs were brought from their barracks, they constructed a grill out of a cleaned up gate, wire and a pine wood trestle. The glowing fire made the air smell spicy. But before they settled down to enjoy the evening, the sergeant made them all line up. On a table in front of him were 56 marksmen's rifles and a pile of books. The candidates were called up individually. The four trainees who did not pass the course were called up first. These would return to their units as ordinary riflemen. Then the graduating marksmen were called up in reverse order, lowest scores first. With a handshake the sergeant handed each of them in turn their rifle they had used on the course, their service record book and a pretty paper from the orderly room inscribed with the Ten Commandments of a marksman. As everybody had expected, Zepp was one of the three best on the course who were called up last. While the sergeant's congratulations were water off a duck's back, Zepp's prize of an ammunition box filled with food was very welcome since it meant he would not have to visit his family empty-handed. With the handing over of their rifles, the trainees had officially become marksmen. But whereas the more inexperienced soldiers were happy about their new status as elite fighters, frontline veterans like Zepp regarded the future with anxiety and foreboding. But not for too long. The life of a Lanza belonged to the moment, and right now there was food and beer to be enjoyed. So he got stuck in and grabbed what he could, because he knew that each day could be his last. While the majority of the course participants were sitting on trains heading for the east, on Sunday afternoon Zepp got a lift to Mittenwald aboard a truck and walked to his home village from there. He had forewarned his family of his visit by letter and his parents and sisters were waiting for him when he knocked on the door. There was no need for words. His parents embraced him emotionally while his sisters stood by uncertainly. Then Zepp turned to them and said, look what I've got for you girls. And with that, he unslung his rifle and, leaning it against the wall, took off his backpack and pulled out bars of chocolate and red tin foil from among the tidbits he'd won. A nice change of pace in this episode, as Zepp gets sent on a quasi-holiday by means of the sniper course. Being the experienced veteran that he is, the course did not teach him anything new, but it gave him an opportunity to share his wisdom with the young soldiers present. He also finally gets issued his scoped K98K. I find this episode very interesting because the training methods are very similar to what the German army uses today still. There is a very big emphasis on starting with the easy stuff and gradually ramping up the difficulty, culminating in a large exercise where you have to apply everything that you've learned. 
There is another big emphasis on interactivity and dialogue and the instructors are encouraged to have the participants share their experiences pertaining to the subject matter. With this method you gain the maximum amount of knowledge during instruction. The prime example being Zepp warning everyone of taking position in a treetop, which is quite obviously a death trap, and the instructor immediately following up on it. That is proper training indeed. Speaking of training, you may have noticed the sniper training film I have playing in the background. This is an excellent film and you can watch it on the channel of YouTube user SecurityGuy42, I will link it down below. It has English voiceover which is very good. Some things are still relevant today, others are quite hilarious like the walking tree costume that was briefly seen a few moments ago. So that's it for today, thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Cheers.